would make threats, but they were pretty consistent uh, as we increased our civil rights activities. And uh, then things got to the point where uh, threats were being made, that people were threatening to bomb the house. There were times when people would come by the house and shoot guns. You have to understand that in the in the years between, say, 1957 and 1961 in Monroe, there were Klan rallies with as many as 15,000 people in attendance. And it was dangerous. They were constantly under attack. And uh, the, the Klan was large and violent, and it killed other people. By 1961, the aggressive approach to local rights problems had brought violence to Monroe. And Williams and his followers had strayed farther away from the main line of Negro thinking. These incidents awakened the concern of moderate whites and Negroes alike. The Ku Klux Klan and other segregationist groups began taking a greater interest in the Monroe situation, too. In line with his policy of armed self-defense, Williams organized Negro gun clubs. The town of Monroe was becoming a potential powder keg, an incident waiting to happen. A railroad slices through Monroe, it's not one town but two towns. On the right, Monroe is white, and on the left is Newtown. Eighteen Freedom Riders came in August 61, at the call of young Rob Williams to see what could be done. We could use the help, so uh, that's when James Foreman and Paul Brooks came into the, uh, to the community to help us to protest, and I think it was uh, Foreman who said that uh, the King forces wanted to prove nonviolence uh, as uh, was, was successful over violence. The only thing I knew, you know, they, they said the Freedom Riders is coming. They said, Rob, we're getting the Freedom Riders to come. And then, you know, the next thing I know, you know, the guys are coming in from New York and places, Washington, D.C. and places. And a lot of those guys, they were going to Harvard and Yale doing research on hunger strike. Well, <clears throat> there was also an English girl who had come, English uh, a student, who had written me a letter and said she was visiting the United States and she had never been to the South. And she heard that we had demonstrations going, and she would like to visit us there. And if, if I would allow her to come, she would come there and help us work with her and whatever she could do. He was the first person I had ever met who could talk about great values and, and splendid ideas and about justice and liberty and sound genuine. and sound convincing and not just be somebody, you know, putting on an act. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me. They didn't really know what they were facing in Monroe. They'd never been through a southern town before. And some of their manners were atrocious. Now, I remember they would tell us, like, say, if you can't take it, don't go up there. Because he said, this, go, this is a non-violence. Like uh, people come up spitting on you, kicking you, and pushing you, and all this kind of stuff, you know. You know, because they said, like, if you go up there, this is probably what's going to happen. If you can't take it, don't go. One of the Freedom Riders who walked in front of me, and uh, this little white girl walks up to him and said, uh, are you a nigger lover? He said, yes, I am. And she spit in his face. Of course, the real hot button is white women, white women and black men. The pavements opposite, on the other side of the road, were clearly packed with people. 
Um, there were certainly people shouting every kind of abuse. Um, they were standing there watching um, and clearly weren't going away. They didn't just happen to be passing. Um, we'll get you nigger and nigger lovers was the, the, the favorite thing. They picketed for a week. Well, <clears throat> the time was coming up for the weekend. And I wasn't participating in the demonstrations at all because I wasn't going to take any pledge for nonviolence. And <clears throat> so I asked them if they were going to rest on uh, Saturday and Sunday, and they said no. Some of the northern protesters uh, came to our church which was Central Methodist, which is right uptown, and uh, demanded to be seated. Of course, we seated them. And I think that they didn't like being seated as far near the front as they were, but nobody tried to hinder them. We weren't warmly welcomed, but we weren't hostilely received. Uh, I think they behaved quite correctly. We were seated we were given these little forms if you're interested in the church in future please fill in um, uh, we came back and I think we had something to eat and then we went into town to pick it thousands of Klansmen Minutemen and other fascist and racist poured into the city and they had said that they were going to crush this demonstration and that they were going to destroy our branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And most of all, they were going to kill me. Then I told the God that it looked like we were going to have a battle that night. You have to understand, these people are separate from Robert Williams in some ways. He's supporting them, he's helping them with some housing, uh, he's willing to help them, but they're really not his people. The situation downtown is so dangerous that uh, that people who were working with Robert Williams went downtown to, to rescue them. Crowds were starting attacking us who were around the courthouse, and the attacks were very, very vicious. We were trying to protect everybody we possibly could, you know, and especially there was young one, one young white uh, lady from um, England, Constant Lever. James Foreman, you know, tried to get me into one of the, one of the cars that had come to take us off. Uh, it wasn't specifically me. There was a move to, to take everybody off. We were told, you know, as soon as the cars come, you all go. Uh, and a group of people had already, had already gone. Um, so he, he tried to, well, he did put me into the car. And that uh, uh, is one of the things that really set the mob off. And the, the police, the other thing that set the mob off is that the police appeared to be on the side of the mob. There was a shotgun in the car. That's not illegal. It's in plain view. And uh, the police took the shotgun and gave it to a member of the mob. He pointed it at James Foreman. He said, uh, don't you dare touch that car, nigger. James Foreman then did what I, I thought at the time was one of the most courageous acts I've seen. The moment the man said to him, don't you dare touch that car, move back, he immediately put his hand on the car. Um, and the man did not respond because, I mean, when people respond with that much courage, it, it does put people off. And so we made a decision um, to put Constant in the car, and, and, and I think I got in the car. Um, and that's when, as I got in the car, the, the barrel came down on my head. He had blood all pouring down, down his shirt. And the police drove us and the black people they'd been trying to arrest from inside the car and drove. We all packed in and drove to the police station. I started going to the telephone. I told him, no, I was too busy. I didn't have to, I wasn't going to accept any more calls. And then they hollered out again and said, well, this is Martin Luther King calling from Atlanta. He wants to talk to you. And I told him, and tell him I, don't, I didn't care who it was, that it was too late now. He didn't come before, 
And now we are already in the